So I'm going to talk, I'm going to be talking about Dig School, um, which is a free online inquiry-based cross-curricular learning program, which all sounds a bit big and heavy, um, but it's themed around archaeology. And we developed it during lockdown last year, during the first lockdown last year, um, with the intention of helping teachers and people doing homeschooling to keep students engaged. Um, I have to say, when we first started it, uh, we didn't, which was in April of last year. So as, as you'll see in a minute, within days, really, of the first lockdown being declared, I didn't really expect it to be quite so current still, kind of, you know, a year and a half, more than a year and a half later. But of course, we're still um, uh, tackling, uh, grappling with the uh, COVID pandemic. And I don't think any of us would put money on not going into lockdown again. Um, in fact, I've just come back from Czech Republic where they've just had a state of emergency declared. And Dutch colleagues, my Dutch colleagues on this international project, which was also involving people from Czech Republic, uh, Dutch colleagues couldn't attend because they are currently locked down. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we made Dig School at a particular point in time, um, but it's still, um, it's still very relevant. It's still there, it's still free, it's still online, um, and it's still there for anybody to have a go at at any time, whether or not you're locked down. So it's as good a way of doing archeology span in the long winter evenings when you can't get out doing field work, um, as it is during uh, lockdown when you can't get out and do field work. Um, so the priorities really for Dig School um, were to keep to involve participants as, as actively as possible and to provide a range of activity types in order to uh, well, technically to kind of maximize knowledge gain uh, to help people learn as, as actively as possible um, while they were just enjoying doing something you absorb something much more easily if you're engrossed in it and enjoying it um, so it was intended to be uh, be learned be followed from the home, thinking about outside. Um, and it's about harnessing archaeology's power um, to be interesting and its interdisciplinarity um, to develop lots of different learning skills. And of course, one thing we did discover when we started to come out of lockdown in July of last year, and then certainly when the new academic year started, was the difficulties that schools were having in trying to uh, enable students to catch up um, because many, many students had found it very difficult to learn during lockdown. And then of course, in last September, we came out of lockdown for two or three months. And by the following January, we were back into lockdown again. And there was then months more of homeschooling uh, when students were not um, in front of their teachers. We wanted to make it enjoyable, fun and interesting. It wasn't following a particular curriculum, so it wasn't teaching you your in-school history, but we wanted it to be a way just to have fun learning. And um, uh, if you may remember from the first lockdown, uh, Joe Wicks was on telly doing his UTP lessons um, and, and Dig School was kind of, uh, you know, like Joe Wicks lessons, only with, as we said, more history and less sweat. Um, it originated the day the UK schools were closed down in March uh, 2020, um, and I was talking to a history teacher I know just about how schools could possibly keep students engaged in learning when they didn't have their normal classes, they didn't have their normal teachers, uh, they didn't have normal resources, they didn't have the goals, they didn't have the support networks or the friendship groups, and of course at the same time all the state exams had been cancelled as well. I have a lot of experience, um, as Susie says, I've done a lot more than uh, time team, I was gonna say just time team, but time team's a pretty big thing itself. Um, but uh, one of the uh, programs I went on to uh, after I finished time team in 2005 was archeological outreach. Um, I set up the Higher Education Field Academy um, and ran activities called Discovery Days, uh, which had involved young people aged from about 10 up to about what, 18 actually, particularly 13, 14 year olds um, in hands-on practical archeology. span And I'd seen how engaging this could be and how it also helped young people develop skills and confidence as well. This is of course not quite as easy to do when you're working online, um, but 
I felt strongly as we all kind of struggle to work out how to cope with this, this first lockdown. And it's easy to forget sometimes quite how dramatic that and unfamiliar that that first lockdown was that that suddenly we were into this world where none of us had experienced before. Um, I felt that one thing I could do, I'm not a, an HS worker, I don't work in food production, I wasn't, uh, but I work in education and teaching and uh, at the University of Lincoln, and I did feel that I could do something to help people stuck at home, and particularly people stuck at home who would normally be learning, or indeed families uh, stuck at home trying to help their children they cared for learn. I consulted with a number of teachers. It was quite difficult to get a hold of people from time to time because everyone was adapting to doing everything from home. But I talked to people like Christine Council and Matt Stanford um, at various historical teaching organisations who were uh, very supportive of the idea that we could set up an online archaeology themed learning programme. Um, I was a trustee of the Council for British Archaeology, and we, we'd had conversations about developing activities for 10 to 15 year olds, uh, but the pandemic suddenly provided the boost to actually make this happen. And the Council for British Archaeology at Archaeology UK um, were immediately on board to support this joint venture. So we had huge challenges with this. The first one was to find funding. Uh, we had to cover basic staff time uh, to do this and develop it as an online package. The second challenge was getting the whole thing set up in an incredibly short time scale. Um, we were at the end of March by this point into the beginning of April by the time we got funding. Uh, we wanted to make the first uh, workshop available the minute the school term started again after Easter, which was the 23rd of April. So we had literally about three weeks to get the whole thing designed and set up, everything from the logo to the platform to the first few workshops. Um, third challenge, of course, was how to adapt the activities that had previously very much been foregrounded on hands-on involvement um, to remote online learning. And then the fourth challenge was doing this when everybody who could possibly be involved or help in any way, shape or form was locked down. We knew that everything would have to be done from home. We had no access to sites, to artifacts, even books. I'd, I'd grab the books I could the last time I was in my university office, and uh, but there's a limit to how many I could move. They're all locked away in my office. I had to get written permission from a pro vice chancellor to set foot on university premises even three months later. So none of this was particularly easy. We were lucky in being able to find funding very promptly from Historic England, who fast-tracked approval of a small grant from their Heritage Schools programme, which is in itself fantastic, but was also very supportive of what we're aiming to do. The second challenge was achieved through great teamwork, which brought in the diverse skill sets um, uh, of knowing how to do the nuts and bolts of, of putting stuff online. Uh, and formatting things properly, uh, and a huge amount of hard work through the whole of Easter, every day, every all weekends, uh, we were kind of flat out on it. Challenge four, and I'll come back to challenge three, challenge four was met really through teamwork and a willingness to be adaptable. Making big school work under lockdown meant we had to let go of unattainable perfection in the interest of getting anything done. We undertook to get two workshops done every week during term from April until July. So there was no scope for not getting things done. And if it meant working till three o'clock in the morning and then hoping for the best, that was the way it had to be done. Challenge three, which was adapting these in-person activities for online remote learning, we agreed to do by developing a downloadable package uh, for every workshop, which would include a podcast talk, a sort of lesson, if you like, split screen with uh, me speaking and PowerPoint slides, a separate PowerPoint for teachers to use to deliver the lesson themselves if they wanted to, a student workbook for students to, to work through, and guidance notes for teachers or carers um, uh, who did not need to have any knowledge at all about the subject. So that whole package of every workshop 
could be delivered by anyone, either teaching themselves or teaching their children or teaching the class. Nobody needed to have any prior knowledge. So the big challenge getting that sort of thing to work. Um, and we also offered live online support twice a week on the days when each of these workshops were launched. So just to give you a bit of a feeling, so this is a, just an introduction to Dig School, and I hope you'll go away and have a look at it and do some of them. Uh, the first one we did um, was based, in fact, on a time team uh, mystery, a skeleton that had turned up during excavations for time team uh, when I was a member of that. And in fact, we've just relaunched time team, in fact, and there should be more time teams on YouTube after Christmas. Um, so History CSI was the first dig school uh, investing, investigating mysterious death through clues from an ancient skeleton. It had the teacher's notes, uh, which meant that again, anybody could just read through it, told you precisely when to stop and start the video and how to uh, present the activities for uh, young people to carry out. And it wasn't just young people, actually. We immediately got emails from people or messages on uh, Twitter saying, oh, you know, I'm retired and I'm, I'm doing this. This has been fantastic. Um, so although it was mainly targeted at children, uh, it's very accessible to people of any age, in fact. Um, and we have the workbook. So here you get an idea. All the workbooks are four page, sort of A4, four pages of A4, with a series of questions and boxes to be filled in. Um, and all sorts of different activities. Um, and this, uh, this workshop uh, took you through the initial discovery of the skeleton, uh, told you something about what we initially thought about it, then offered some more evidence uh, and invited students to try and puzzle out who this person might have been, and then offered a bit more evidence uh, that enabled students to start to puzzle out uh, what the circumstances were around uh, their death, which was uh, very obviously violent from the very beginning. This is no spoiler here. You can see from the hole in that skeleton's head that something uh, was a fairly severe injury there. And then at the end, students are actually invited to do a sort of a mock trial to try and identify who the assailant might have been. Um, so it was very much introducing archaeology as a, as a process very akin to a detective story where you have evidence which provides clues to something that's happened, um, but you don't know everything about what's happened. The only real difference in an archaeological context being that you have absolutely no chance of being able to interview any of your suspects. Um, the second dig school um, took a rather different theme. It was about how things change over time. Um, and again, there's the video, the, the screenshots here are just the link from uh, the website uh, where you can just click on watch the videos on YouTube, um, uh, talking about how things change over time. Here are the pages in the booklet um, on page two. Um, there was space uh, where uh, or student, anybody would draw a picture of the room, a room they know well as it is today. Um, and they would, at the time, it was a, a, a copy that somebody sent in to us, sent a picture of it, I think, emailed a picture of this drawing. You see, it's a living room, there's a sofa and a television and a table and so on there. Um, and then after they'd done that, uh, the teacher's notes instructed them to spin the video on a little bit. And the next thing they were asked to do was draw a picture of that same room in 2000 years time, uh, thinking about what would, let, what would be left, what would survive, having thought about how organic material, like anything made of uh, wood or fabric would have rotted away, um, but the stuff made of glass or uh, ceramic, uh, like light bulbs or windows or brick walls or so on, would have survived. And then in the final page of the booklet, people were asked to reconstruct, having swapped their booklet with somebody else, they were asked to reconstruct what the room would have looked like originally. And of course, you could swap those images online if you were doing it with others from your class, um, or if you were in school, for those students who were in school, you could swap with other um, students in the, in the, in the room. Um, or people in the same house could actually choose, uh, uh, choose a, a 
different room or a, a place they knew that might be somewhere else, draw that from memory, and then still have that sense of trying to reconstruct from the drawing of what the room would have looked like in 2000 years time, very much an archeological puzzle that we encounter all the time. We find uh, the evidence from something that happened a long time ago, but so much of it has gone through the passage of time that we're trying to reconstruct what things were like from tiny fragments. Uh, and that's exactly the process that was being gone through with this room. And of course, what you very quickly learn when you're trying to reconstruct what was somewhere what was in a place in the past is what you really need is for what's found to be really carefully recorded and labeled. A scribbled space just saying stuff tells you nothing. But if you've got a, a neat drawing showing bits of flat, clear uh, glass, uh, you can reconstruct perhaps that that's likely to be a window uh, rather than say a broken bottle or indeed just stuff. So this is about sort of understanding the process of change over time and also about the, pro the importance of recording. Uh, third one uh, went on called location, location, location was about place. Here there was a, a game, uh, having gone through it at the beginning, we went through a whole series of examples of reconstruction drawings, again from a time team book, in fact, um, about how places change over time. There was then uh, some exercises about how you would choose where to live. And then the third page of the booklet here is a map of a place where, rather like when you're playing battleships, uh, you had to position your settlements, your major village, your smaller bits of the village, your outlying uh, sort of uh, outlying overnight shelters in the landscape, and then play with an opponent to try and spot where their villages are, uh, where their settlements are, and the winner is the first one to spot everyone else's settlement. We really tried in all of the workshops to have some element of game, a game to play, um, but we didn't have the resources or the time to develop interactive computer games. But we did have the time to develop these downloadable resources, which you could play as paper-based games or indeed on the screen. Um, I'll just take you through this one a little bit. This is Animal Farm, uh, which is about the role of animals in the past today. Uh, you can see the four pages of the booklet there with pictures of skeletons to be identified. Um, it started off with a quick quiz. So the first page was answer. You just put in the answers to your quiz questions. I'll just go through those um, and you can see if you know the answers to any of them. Uh, and, and I appreciate some of you, be, you will be watching this in recording afterwards, so I won't stop for too long on it. But um, the first question was, which animal's bones were used to build this prehistoric house? Um, and the students then had a minute to write down the answer. And the answer is mammoth. I wonder if you got that right. Second one is, what was the first animal in the world to be domesticated by humans? So uh, I think if you know the answer to that, the answer is actually the dog. And in fact, here's the dates when all well, major animals were domesticated in different parts of the world. The most recent one uh, on this list being rather seasonally, the turkey, which is around about 100 BC, 100 AD, um, much, much later than the dog, which is perhaps 14 to 30,000 years ago. Next question was, how many secondary products of animals are there? We were thinking about the relationship between animals and humans. Secondary product is a product that can be used without killing the animal. How many can you think of? Um, again, you, have a, you can have a minute perhaps to think about, perhaps think about one product of animals you can use without killing the animal. So there are lots. There's milk, perhaps is an obvious one. Wool, another obvious one. Fur, uh, blood. You can actually bleed animals without um, actually killing them. Uh, antler is a useful raw material. Uh, Feces, poo, surprisingly useful. Urine, again, surprisingly useful. Uh, traction, pulling things, uh, oxen to pull plows. Transport, uh, uh, horses uh, to ride or uh, animals to pull carts. Um, pest control, cats to eat rats, for example. And then, of course, animals can also produce more animals when you breed them. So there's just a few of the many ways in which we can use animals beyond just eating them or keeping them as pets. I haven't actually put companionship on that list. 
And then another question was, which animal was believed to have passed on fleas with Black Death Plague bacteria causing a pandemic which killed half the population of the world in the 14th century? Again, a rather topical question as we're still in the middle of our pandemic, uh, although the mortality rates have, thank God, been nothing like that of the Black Death. Can you remember which animal that was? Any knowledge, any guess? It's the black rat. Though actually plague can be transmitted by lots of other ground-dwelling rodent type mammals, squirrels, marmots, lemurs, prairie dogs. You'd be surprised how many people die of plague just through uh, contact with say prairie dogs in America. Seven people a year die of plague in America on an average year. And what secondary animal product did a medieval Bateman sell? You know anyone whose surname is Bateman? Back in time, their ancestors would have sold dog poo. Dog poo, well, feces and urine are used widely in the tanning industry to treat and preserve leather. Uh, again, surprisingly useful resource, but probably not a great job. And then which animals, uh, final question was, which animals farmed their meat for thousands of years in South America became popular as pets in Europe from the 16th century? This is one of those questions, if you know the answer to it, you'll know it really well. And if you don't, you'll probably be quite surprised. Because the answer is guinea pigs. And that is a picture of guinea pig uh, if you ordered it from a restaurant in, for example, Peru. So we talked a bit in the dig school again. It's a quick quiz, it's lighthearted, people have tot up their scores, but you learn a little bit about the relationship between humans and animals doing that. Um, we then thought about how you could recognise digs, that this, this particular workshop then goes on to think about how we recognise animals in the archaeological record, which is mostly through their bones because everything else tends to rot away. Um, so there's then question, draw what you think this animal looked like when it was alive. Now, I'm not going to show you what this animal actually was because it's in the dig school workshop and it is quite instructive to try and draw it, what you think that animal was. Um, and you will have heard of this animal, I promise you, um, though you might not think it looks very familiar as you look at it now. Um, but we went through, the, 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 the workshop goes through other examples from just a um, skeleton, that's probably quite an easy one. So it's a red deer. Easier to see when you get the outline and you'll see the Latin name of it is actually written in the bottom left hand corner as well. It's a lot easier when you can see the outline of the animal. Of course, you don't get that when you find these in the archaeological record. In fact, what you normally get is not even the whole skeleton, you just get a few bones or fragments of bones. Another one here. Can you guess what that is? Okay, it's a chicken. Another one. Yeah, and I think, is that quite easy? Looking at those horns, it's about looking at diagnostic characteristics. It's a cow. Um, this one, perhaps a little bit more difficult. And you very quickly realize that what you really need to know is how big this skeleton is, um, because uh, this doesn't have quite the external characteristics, though uh, those feet perhaps are a bit of a clue and those big front teeth on the bottom jawbone, because it's a pig with tusks. Um, this is another one, again, one of the different characteristics, it's got a long tail, it's quite lightly built there, a bit difficult to tell, it's a dog, very familiar sort of animal, We've probably all seen dogs around, probably quite recently, some of you may even have pet dogs. Um, and then another example, so what is this? Again, just the, um, you've got the name there, it might not be very familiar. It doesn't look very much like how it does when it's alive. You look at those teeth and those look quite fierce, um, but actually it's a rabbit. <laughs> so that's about getting people to think about what's missing. Um, and then we actually looked at in the next bit of the workshop, looked at what these bits of bones look like when you actually find them. By the time I did this workshop, I had managed to get permission to get to uh, the, uh, Place where I keep some of my finds that have been managed, been able to get hold of some finds to actually use uh, for dig school, but it took a lot of paperwork to, just to do that under lockdown. Um, so these are bits of bone, you can see the size, they're from a sheep, they're from the femur, the, um, that leg there, um, and they're part of that sort of state. You can see the cut marks across them where they've been sawn, and you can see the sort of circular bit of bone in the middle there. You know, it's very familiar, it's very obvious when you know. 
than not obvious if you don't know. So you're always putting clues together. And again, getting your head around this through this dig school. And this is, um, again, probably quite recognizable, but maybe not, easy if you know. Um, it's from a cow and it's a horn. Um, cow horn is used, the, the sort of outside of a horn, which is very much like the stuff your fingernails are made of. Um, it's incredibly useful raw material in the past because when you heat it up, when you boil it up, it goes soft and it really behaves quite like plastic. So it's very useful molding into things. And then uh, the uh, workshop moves on to a couple of case studies, one of which is about Henry VIII. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it basically relates to the fact when Henry VIII came to the throne in 1509, he was um, embarrassed by the puny state of English horses because there were none big enough to be decent sized war horses. Um, and there's a comment here, the breed of good and strong horses of this realm is decayed and is likely to decay further. A speedy remedy is not provided. So he brings in a load of laws to control the size of breeding age mares, um, stallions, so only the bigger ones are bred from, um, uh, and to destroy horses that are undersized, infertile, or can't work. So it's quite a robust, uh, intensive breeding program to try and make horses bigger over breeding generations. Henry's very optimistic this would work. There has begun a good number of breed of horses, which by continuance is like in short time, much to increase. So he's saying these new horses, these, they're gonna increase in size quickly. But the Venetian ambassador to England says this island produces greater number of horses than any other region in Europe, but they're weak and a bad wind. That means they can't breed very well. They can't stand much work. And the exercise in the workshop uh, looked, uh, gave data on the size of the bones and asked students to think whether or not Henry's plan had worked by looking at the height of horses measured from their bones. A couple of the dig schools even built up to when uh, we've gone through the general principles like how things change over time, specific evidence like uh, site bones, uh, particular themes like looking at aerial photographs in relation to particular places, then built up to two workshops about actually doing your own digging. Um, here at workshop 13, DIY dig went through the process to enable anyone to dig in their garden or their school grounds. Um, and the second workshop even did health and safety, which we think we actually managed to make quite fun. Um, and we got comments back on Twitter um, and social media from schools and individuals who were doing one meter square test fit excavation, looking for the finds, which they could send us in photographs of, which we could identify for them. It's a great way to get people physically active during, again, lockdown. Um, we had thousands of people took part in dig school. Um, uh, we have pictures uh, from some who sent them in. Uh, and we can see, although everyone was on their own, um, they were all working on similar questions, similar themes, using these workbooks and the recorded videos um, to go through, think about the questions, think about the answers, play the games and learn a little bit while feeling connect with, connected with others and still having a bit of fun. Um, the feedback, we, we got feedback from the online survey through SurveyMonkey. Again, it's difficult to get feedback when you're online when you don't have people in a room. Um, but as you can see, the ratings was excellent. Most of you know, that over 70% rated it excellent. Nearly all of the remainder uh, rated it good. Um, and um, when we looked also, and this is picking up a little bit of what Derwin was talking about, about well-being and the psychological impact of archaeology and participation. Um, and, you know, Dig School wasn't as participatory and as group-based as we'd have liked it to be. Um, but we did ask people about how, it, how they felt it has affected their um, uh, various aspects of related to well-being. Um, and you can see here in these graphs, the green and the blue are the highest sort of um, uh, where people felt maybe strongly agreed or agreed that participating in dig school had made them, uh, given them this particular emotion, emotion or sense or, or feeling. Um, uh, the top one on the left there is happy. As you can see uh, nearly all people agreeing or strongly agree they felt happy after dig school. Um, again, the next one down is capable. And the next one down is curious, really interesting that actually one of the sentiments that comes out most strongly is curiosity, people feeling curious. 
uh, that again is strongly associated with a raised sense of well-being. You have an interest in the world and curiosity about what's going on. Uh, even optimism, and this of course again was in the middle of lockdown, even optimism, people are uh, generally, most people are feeling they do feel uh, more or much more optimistic. People are feeling more interested. That's the top on the right hand side there. Again, that's a very, very strong positive response. Uh, feeling proud um, as well. A lot of people of what they've done, keen to try new things, third one down there, and confident in ability as well. And there are sort of other statistics as well. But I'm not going to talk too much uh, about that. I don't want to overrun. Um, there are 21 dig school workshops. We did 20 in 2020 and then did another one in 2021. Um, there are a whole load of the ones, particularly workshops um, 9 through to 13, really are very much about place-based study using aerial photographs or place names, going through that sort of evidence to study the place you're in. Um, the extra, the ones after workshop 15 to 20 are really about how to process your information, how to write it up. Uh, and in fact, the, there's even a sort of a, a snakes and ladders game that you can play to actually uh, do uh, collect artifacts from an excavation if you haven't actually undertaken one. Um, and then workshop 21 that we did in 2021 as an added on one as part of the, part of the Council for British Archaeology's Festival of Archaeology is called Look Up, and that's about looking at the buildings around you. So um, do have a look at Dig School if you think you might be interested. They're all there, all free, and everything is there for you to be able to work through any of those that you fancy. And there's a little intro to each one at the beginning, which will give you uh, an explanation of what it's about. And so I hope you enjoy that as part of this Wings to the Past Cosford project, um, and look forward to hearing how you get on. Thank you very much.